Movies on video cassette. Welcome to Strange Glow Video. Guys, I'm eating junk and watching rubbish. We're oozing with VHS, horror, nostalgia, and more. New better block glow in the dark. After it comes to videotape, you can get a glow in the dark hand puppet from the movie Casper. And now, your hosts, Alec, Justin, and Nick. Hey, you're not allowed to rent here anymore. Yeah! Hey, welcome back to Strange Glow Video. My name is Justin. With me is my esteemed colleague, co-host extraordinaire, uh, Alec. How you doing? Hey, how's it going? It's me, Alec. Talking into the microphone. Yeah. You like it in your face like that? You can do hands-free mic in the face? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got nice. a new uh, mic arm here. New ring light, so... Yeah, I got a new ring light on mine. We got a pretty cool like local shop in town that basically buys like damaged freight and shit. So we get some good deals in there. So uh, we were able to pick up some very nice equipment for very, very cheap. Indeed. And the mic cable in mine does work. So very nice. That's good. Uh, so yeah. So tonight we got to talk about Furiosa, a Mad Max story. A Mad Max saga. Saga, sorry. God damn it. I knew I'd get something wrong there. <laughs> it's all right. Usually, I'm, if there's going to be something gets fucked up on here, I'm going to pretty much do it, whether that's a name pronunciation or something else. Yeah. It's all good, though. Someone's got to be that guy. Vincent Dornafrio. <laughs> that's my Dinofrio. favorite still. Isn't it Dornafrio or whatever? It's Dornafrio, yeah. not Dornafrio or whatever. That's like a bunch of extra syllables. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, a couple of things before we start about talking about Mad Mix. So, we're both doing the AMC A list, and like this isn't an ad for them or anything, but they did have a good deal going on for summer. If you're going to see a lot of the movies this summer and you're like us and you're on a budget, they're offering the first month for a dollar with a three month commitment, including that one month. So, you're basically looking at if you go with the basic tier plan, which I think is about $20 per month, depending on what state you live in, pricing varies depending on geographic location. And if you want to go in one more than one state, like. Yeah, there's a couple different plans on there. And I look through them. I got the cheapest one because it still allows you to have like one main theater and go to your local theaters, especially if like you, there's certain state exclusions like California and New York. So those places are more expensive, but like. By more expensive, it's like 25, 30 bucks a month instead of 20. So it's still worth it if you're going more than twice. If, once you go twice, you've paid for it. So it's it's worth it if you like movies and you've been missing out and stuff like me. Well, I mean, if you and if you buy food or drink there, it's like a free upgrade from a medium to a large for soda and popcorn if you're going to buy that shit there. And you have and access other... to a lot of deals. So like the student popcorn and soda, that's five bucks. If you have a student ID, you get access to that as an A-list as well. You just have to pull it up on your phone. Nice. So that's like, you know, five bucks. That's worth it. That, I would get a popcorn and soda if it's five bucks. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's a good deal. Since I'm in school, I, w I need to see if I can get a, an ID just for that reason. <laughs> it's like uh, I'm going online, but shit, I'll, I'll take some cheaper stuff there. Like, sign me up. I like a discount. Yep. Yeah, so the A-list, uh, I think, you know, I have I've did it. I signed up for it for Furiosa, paid a buck, and then the other two months are nineteen ninety five or whatever plus tax. So you're looking at, like, if you go for every movie I wanted to see this summer, it basically pays for itself and then something, and I'll save a ton of money. And, like, for Furiosa, I paid a buck, and I saw it on IMAX. Like, yeah, the IMAX is included and everything else, so it's it's a damn good deal. There's some movie I sent you yesterday that comes out this weekend. Oh, it's called In a Violent Nature? Yeah, that and sounds fascinating. People are saying it's a lot like like a artsy Friday the 13th, essentially. So that sounds interesting. It's about a killer that looks like he has a fucking like, uh, diving mask on and a hook. And he comes out of a lake and he like stalks people and kills them. And he's mute. Sound familiar? And... Uh, so I'm pretty interested in that, and it's getting pretty interesting reviews. Uh, so we'll see. It has a lot of... It says it emphasizes static long-take shots and features no musical score. 
Okay, that's very interesting to me because to me, usually in horror, what makes horror good is the score because it creates the vibe. But I'm interested to see this just because of the lack of score and see what that tonally does to a film. Yeah. So, yeah, it's releasing theatrically May 31st, and I'm like, well, I have this. I wouldn't have to pay extra. I might go see that Thursday. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, there's just so many options now with that. I mean, and it's like I'm on the basic plan, and I think you can see three movies a week. Yeah, which is I'm never going to see that many a week, so that's fine. Yeah, I know. That's what I was thinking. I was like, damn, I'm like, unless I were to see something over and over again, but with just my schedule, it's not feasible. But the <laughs> right. fact that I could if I wanted to is reassuring. So I'm like, all right, that's that's a pretty good, pretty good program. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for uh, for that because we got a lot of interesting stuff coming out this summer and fall. Got obviously Beetlejuice two. That new trailer just dropped. Yeah, that was an interesting trailer. We actually saw that ahead of Furiosa, which is nice to see it. Yeah, in and a theater. I, I figured it would be on Furiosa basically because it dropped that morning on that Thursday morning. So I figured it would have to be ahead of the. Furiosa, yeah. because why would you drop a trailer that day and that morning without it having to be on a new movie release? So, yeah, for sure. That makes sense. It was nice to see it on the big screen for sure that day. And uh, then we got Deadpool and Wolverine that's coming out. And I saw that trailer again before I think you showed up after you were in line getting a soda pop or something. Yeah, I was getting a drink. And, uh, yeah, we saw it in IMAX, so that was pretty cool. I mean, it's AMC IMAX. So, honestly, it's kind of annoying because the chairs are much worse than the normal AMC laser screens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the they don't have the recliner seat in there. I obviously get it, you know, for that IMAX, you want to have a larger it. audience. So, Yeah, it is what it is. But uh, what do you wanna, where do you want to start with this thing? Well, I mean, so... Last week, we talked about, uh, obviously, Mad Max Fury Road, and this is a direct prequel to that. Obviously, George Miller here doing his thing again, right? And if you think about it, he's done all the Mad Max features. And Happy um, Feet. Yeah. Yeah, he's had some other like stuff that's like way out of left field, and you're like, what the hell? And it's just like, he's not limited to any style or genre. But the fact that he keeps coming back to the story, and I think he's 79 now, is pretty fascinating. And they said they've got a couple more Mad Max stories for him as well, kind of like already developed. And the interesting thing I read ahead of this was that when they wrote Fury Road, they wrote so much of the script that they already had basically Furiosa's the script. Oh yeah. They also with this. They all had developed an entire anime series to go along with Fury Road that was going to be the Furiosa story. And then they, George Miller was like, this you now this is too good. I need to direct this. Yeah. And I remember and I, even when this, when Fury Road came out, I was reading about it online. And I remember reading then that he already had plans to do Furiosa. Like he had, he's been planning this movie since at least 2012 to be a, a movie because they shot Fury Road in 2012. Then it didn't come out till 2015. Yeah, I mean, that was because, on the shelf for a while. Not, not on the shelf per se, but probably in editing and in negotiations and et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's a lot of post production on that movie and a lot of editing, and I think they just weren't in a rush to do it. Right? There was, as long as you'd already waited to do it, there's no need to rush it. And that movie shows for it. And obviously, this does Furiosa does as well, right? I mean, I was really impressed with this. Runtime is what about two hours and thirty eight minutes or something like that. Yeah, it didn't feel quite that long. It it was a long movie. Like it feels like a longer action movie, but like it is still fully immersing. Like you're just you're into it. The only thing that threw me through a loop a little bit and it didn't really change the outcome of the story, but it was just getting into your own head was the fact that Anya Taylor-Joy playing Furiosa like she's obviously a, a headline top billing, right? And she doesn't come in till like damn near an hour into the film, it seems like. Yeah. And it's, so to it's me around there. And so to me, that was the only thing that was messing with my mind a little bit. 
and distracting me from a viewing experience, but overall I'm still happy with it. Like had I known that or going into it, it wouldn't have bothered me at all, but just going on ahead, I was like, well, when's the time change going to happen? Cause we kind of expected that right. Based on the trailers and things, we knew there's going to be some leaps and changes in time and wasn't too worried about it, but that justifies the runtime in this movie, right? Cause you get a nice hour of young Furiosa. And then we really get the story that really carries us through to the end that goes directly into Fury Road, which was fucking incredible the way they did well, that. Well, see, the thing is, a lot of people, I have conflicting opinions on this ending. Okay. Because if it does what some people think it's doing, then it chronologically makes absolutely zero fucking sense. However, if there's a time jump there that we don't see of like 10 years, then it makes sense for a lot yeah. of reasons. <clears throat> I'm going to point them out real quick. So at the end of this movie, spoilers. If you haven't seen it, obviously, you hopefully you have seen it by now. If you haven't, that makes sense because the box office is really bad. We'll talk about that in a little bit, too, and why we think it is. But uh, so at the end of this movie, it sort of shows you Furiosa leading the bride's into her truck, essentially yeah, her the, the, the war rig, uh -huh. and it's showing you kind of like, oh, this is where Fury Road starts, at least from her perspective. So, if that happens, like the same week as all that other shit that just happened, doesn't make a lot of sense, unless the time jumps before were much longer. Because Immortan Joe and Fury Road is much older than this Immortan Joe. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, there's issues with that. Gastown's completely rebuilt in Fury Road. So is Bullet Farm. They're going to have no issues. So it's been a while. It could not be. There has to be a time jump there. And I think it seems it's very... But when you watch it, it seems like you're watching fucking Rogue One and it's leading into New Hope. But it, I, there has to be a time jump there, otherwise it chronologically makes no sense. Unless George Miller just is like, fuck it, it's a movie, I'm ignoring that, I don't care that much. Yeah, I mean, I didn't overthink that. I assumed there was a time jump, but the only thing that doesn't explain a time jump in the movie is the fact that there's like sequence cards in this movie that kind of show you like as we're going through chapters. And there wasn't a chapter card there to kind of say that after... Well, there yeah, wouldn't okay. be because it's the end of the movie. I get that because it was literally it was just like a minute of film time, maybe, of that. Then it was the absolute end. Yeah. So I think that that is a little bit confusing, but overall I'm assuming there's a 10, 15-year time jump for a number of reasons, right? Because um, Anya Taylor-Joy is a much younger actor. And obviously, we lost the uh, Immortan Joe actor. He passed away since Fury Road was filmed, mm -hmm. recast, which they did a great job recasting him because it looked fucking spot on. Like it was well done. He looked like a younger Immortan Joe. Yeah. Like yeah, 20 so, years younger. And so that worked out pretty well. But just based on those time jumps. And then th the other thing was um, I read that George Miller wanted to actually de age. Uh, was it? Charlize Theron? Yeah. They wa he wanted to de-age her to play Furiosa in this, but he said he changed his mind after he saw The Irishman and just didn't think the technology was there. He's like, he didn't like it, just decided to recast at that point. So yeah, that I makes, actually... That makes, and I would agree with that. I think that was a, the right move. I think she does a great job. I watched uh, an interview last night with him, and uh, Edgar Wright was interviewing him, actually. And if you don't know Edgar Wright, he directed... Uh, you know, my, one of my favorite movies of all time, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, The World's End. He did uh, Baby Driver, and then he did recently Last Night in Soho, which starred Anya T Taylor Joy. And uh, that's where George Miller saw her. Like, oh, shit, that's Furiosa. And he explained that up there. That was pretty interesting to me. Yeah, I think they did a great job with that. And to your point, like, that was my biggest complaint is the lack of an explanation in that gap, but there has to be a gap. There's just no other way for it. Like why else would all these characters age that much? And I think in that story, you don't need to see that gap filled.
because we already know where it goes. So we just see how her side of the story begins for Fury Road, which the in, the credits were very interesting to me because it was uh, almost like a recap of Fury Road for you. If you didn't know, like it kind of highlighted some of the best moments in that movie or not even best moments, but some of the significant moments. What also does that that ends in like a what's a prequel that ends that does that? I'm, I've seen it before where it like flashes and shows you a whole bunch of the next movie and it kind of makes you want to go and watch that movie. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to look up an example of that, but I mean, I, I enjoyed that in the theater. Um, yeah. From a filming perspective, there were some things in this movie that stood out different to me than Fury Road. Like Fury Road, in my opinion, was shot so beautifully. And this is shot very well as, too, right? There's, it just felt a little different. And I've heard a lot of, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've heard a lot of people say that basically, like, they think that practic, like, visual effects, a lot of people think peaked in like the mid 2000, mid 2010s. And now we're on the other side where it's getting goofy again because, okay. like, it, it's not like this looked bad. It looks no. good, but there's, there was something off about it where it definitely looked like, it, uh, like I don't even know how to describe it. Like, but the high contrast of like a fucking like Mr. Beast thumbnail. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. was like, "What the fuck is this?" And that uh, may very in... was that not... intentional? Like, I don't, I don't know. But right. for me, it just stood out different because Fury Road truly 100% feels post-apocalyptic with the lighting and like in the desert. Like, you fucking get like dry mouth just sitting there watching that movie because it just seems so fucking miserable from yeah. the heat and the dryness in this movie. Like I had moments of that, but there's also some moments where I just felt a little disconnected from the dystopian future of it. It just seemed like it was too, too polished in some spots. And like, it's a very minor gripe because this picture high, if I were to rate it right now, I'd give it a nine out of 10 and I would say it's a must see in theaters. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I want to, I, I actually might end up seeing it again in theaters if it's still in there in a few weeks when I have, you know, just on a day off because it's very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, and for me, like a second viewing of a movie like this, because it is a long running movie, right? Almost three hours. And knowing that that first hour is going to kind of be this flashback, that would really allow me just to sit back and take the movie in and really reflect on it and enjoy it a lot more. I'd be able to just focus in on the moment and like take in some of that early scenery and early story and development that i was kind of wondering like well, are we going to get past this soon are we going to get past this soon and yeah. just getting in my own head and allowing that to detract from my enjoyment of the first hour of the film now that said i still really liked it but i was just like waiting for that hop and it just kept fucking with me and i don't, I don't know why like it just i was like is it here is it here yeah it, i can see that i uh I kind of expected, I, I I went in knowing that there was a young Furiosa, but I didn't know how young, because I saw the trailers. I didn't know how long it was going to be. I expected more like 20, 30 minutes tops, but it's more like 40 minutes to an hour somewhere in there. But mm -hmm. I didn't have any problems with it, especially because Chris Hemsworth was part of that story too. So it's like at that point, I was so absorbed into what was going on with all that fucking motorcycle chariot and shit. I was just like, all right, I'm in. This is awesome. He fucking kicked ass in this movie, right? And even him aging in this movie was fucking so well done. Like, because his character, you know, like the earlier scenes, like when he first meets Furiosa, he's basically empathetic to her as being a child, like still a piece of shit, but like explains that he had a family in the past time. That's why he carries that teddy bear around with him. Yeah, tries to bond with her, tries to protect her a little bit, like while enslaving her. So it's really fucking twisted when you think about it. And you just like see him just fucking lose all of his humanity by the end of this movie. Like he's just like a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. Full on just like gives up completely. Like whereas early on, like you see, like there's this character that things could have gone either way for him. And it's pretty interesting to see that. And this is the way he played the character, right? You know, we're so used to him being the mighty fucking Thor, you know, and all that kind of shit, or, you know, whatever else you've seen him in. And well, seeing him grovel and shit is awesome. Yeah. Like basically like, yeah, this is the end of my life. 
it's pretty fucking cool. I'm, I'm here for it. And I love it anytime like he can just have his natural accent, right? It's just fucking so awesome. It just it really allowed him to take that character where it needed to go. Well, yeah, that's, that's what I, I really like about that is like, you know, this movie is an Australian movie, Australian director started with Australian actors. I like how they keep putting Australian actors in this shit. Mm hmm. Here for it. Great choice. Yeah, it was it was awesome. And he's like such a shitty villain because like part of you wants to like cheer for him just because like, yeah, this is a dystopian future. It fucking sucks for everybody. But then he's like, you know what? Fuck this. And he just really is just says fuck everybody. And so he's an interesting character to watch. And then even seeing his own guys like go against him when they see him lose his humanity. Like his own crew wants to split off from him and like try to antagonize him and cause some issues, which I thought was a good bit of the story there that I really enjoyed. And then Furiosa, like having this like love hate relationship for him, right? She, there was like some kind of respect there. You kind of felt that she didn't despise everything because she seemed to be fairly well treated, but obviously not in the ideal situation. Uh, and so seeing that like play out was. You know, I guess anyone that's experienced trauma is like probably could fucking relate to like how screwed up that is. Like it's almost like Stockholm syndrome, like where where you uh, begin to appreciate like your fucking captor and like think that you're in love with them, but not to that extreme in this. But that's just like a family, a dysfunctional family is like how that early stuff felt with her and and Chris Hemsworth, and fucking fascinating just to see how that all played out. Yeah, it's uh, it reminded me a little bit. It's like he's almost keeping there because he thinks she has potential to like become his like successor and daughter type figure. Mm -hmm. So it's reminiscent of the very first Mad Max to me because, you know, the toe cutter has has that in the character, and mm -hmm. that character is the one he ends up leaving cuffed at the end of the movie. Yeah, and it's so interesting, like seeing how this film series has gone through it, right? Obviously, the original is a classic, but I don't even think the original holds up in as many people's mind. I think the Road Warrior is like what most people associate from that original trilogy, right? As the true Mad Max, as like the Road Warrior kind of being the, the whole shebang. I think that's what people see as the best of that original three. Yeah. And then this came out, after Fury Road, which Fury Road is very fucking highly regarded as one of the best action films of all time. You know, that and The Road Warrior. Yeah. And this, I think, fits right in there with it. But, you know, we, we noticed that the box office wasn't amazing. And you said you had some so thoughts on that. So, like, I've what seen, did you... I've seen lots of people speculating on this in YouTube videos. Several people are making videos about it. And their titles are, you know, why is Furiosa bombing? And it's like three or four different videos I've seen about this in the last day or two now because it hit news. Like, you know, because it, yesterday was Monday, so it's like the weekend. And so now it's Tuesday. We're hearing all about how much it made the entire Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And it ain't that good. <clears throat> uh, it, I think it barely... Did it end up beating Garfield for the full weekend? I didn't see stats today. I didn't look anything up. I don't know. I saw uh, either way. Uh, I think it did 20 million or something like what? What is this? Uh, well, look it up because I know I am right now. I know Garfield did really well. And I think better than projected to do. And I don't know if it's just more families wanted to go to the theater this weekend. You know, we had a lot of shitty, severe weather like. OK, yeah. So latest weekend, May 24th through the 26th. Mad Max is Furiosa. 26.3 million is what it did. The Garfield okay. movie did 24. Imaginary Friends, the if movie that looks like shit to me, uh, did 16 million. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes did 13. And then The Fall Guy did six. Okay. Surprised The Fall Guy is still doing that well, considering that's been on video on demand for a couple of weeks now, it seems like. Honestly, it didn't look like a terrible movie. It kind of looked like it might be kind of decent, but I. 
also wasn't like, oh, I have to go see it. <laughs> so I was going to see that at a double feature at the drive-in, but we just didn't wind up going that weekend. And then the last two weekends, the drive-in that's been open around here was playing that with Kung Fu Panda. And I'm like, I have no desire to see Kung Fu Panda. Yeah, so, no, fuck no. <laughs> I was hoping they'd play Planet of the Apes with Fall Guy, and then I was going to be in for that double feature. Like, fuck yeah, but it didn't work out that way. You should still see the Apes in theaters if you can. If you get oh, yeah. Now that I've got this pass, I really want to try to swing by and make that happen. So, Really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was interesting on the box office. Like, I don't know what they're originally projecting, but historically speaking, like the Memorial Day weekends usually kind of like the launch to the summer blockbuster. Kind of like that. We're right in that time frame where that's usually one of the first big box offices of the year. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if there's even the traditional stuff doesn't seem to be going the same way we expect it to. Well, here's something interesting. Ghostbusters is number five for this year in the box office. And that just crossed 200 million. I think finally yeah. this past weekend as well. And, you know, that's obviously streaming on demand and for purchase now as well for digital. So, so far this year, Dune part two is number one. Godzilla versus Kong, the new empire, then Kung Fu Panda, then Planet of the Apes, then Ghostbusters. <clears throat> interesting and movies are tough man like it just costs so much right and like so when I think about movies I think it's usually just me going right I'm not taking the kids a lot you know for, just for one there's just not a lot of shit that's like worth it to take them to unless it's something they really want to see right and you have that and then yeah I mean it's it's a cost thing right now and right and people don't have as much discretionary spending for that shit so if you can't afford it like what are you going to do like i could take the whole family out to the theater and get snacks and drinks and spend a hundred bucks or i could wait an extra month and a half or two months or whatever the window is from theatrical release to the digital release and spend 25 to own it right and so when you're looking at it from a family like on a shitty budget or a limited budget, or just, you know, we all know finances suck for most people right now. Yeah. And uh, it's tough. So, I, I mean, seeing the box office doing as well as it is, but that's the thing, though. Like, people always need an escape because reality fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. So, I can tell you there's at least four movies that come out this year so far, at least, that I'll be buying on physical releases. Obviously, Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. The Godzilla Kong movie, which I haven't even seen, but I'm going to buy it because I have the all the other ones except I think I don't think I have Godzilla versus Kong, the, the first one, but I have the rest of the MonsterVerse. So, okay, just for that sake, and it's Godzilla, I'm going to get it regardless. Even if it's terrible, I want to have it in the collection. Mm -hmm. um, Abigail, the vampire movie. I still recommend you check that out if you ever get a chance. It's probably out of theaters by now, but it might be hitting something eventually. Yeah, it's on uh, digital streaming, so. And then, yeah, Furiosa. Definitely be buying that, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know I'm going to buy Twisters regardless of how good it is, just because yeah. I love the first one so much, and I'm going to have that in the collection regardless. And then, obviously, the original Twister hits its 4K release this summer. Still book Blu-ray, so there's a couple of versions of that out there up for pre-sale. Like, obviously, that's not a... New release, but um, a 4K release, home release. So, uh, but back to Furiosa, um, <laughs> you know, because we kind of got off the fucking track there. I think that it was such a fun story as far as like breaking it down. And I really love seeing this movie be its own thing, but still feeling so in world with the rest of the franchise. What was your uh, favorite costume and whose gang would you join from this movie? Fuck, man. I got to tell you, um, Chris Hemsworth's costume was pretty badass when it was just like the fucking white tarp early on. He was like a disformed Jesus. He was, and it was fucking like oddly. He seemed very cultish, cult leaderish. Oh, early yeah. on, like in a way, like he was wooing people where like later on, he just became an asshole and was like used intimidation and fear. But early on, he like wooed people and like legit had people believe in him to be what they thought he should be. And uh, that fucking 
chariot tricycle setup that he had was fucking glorious, man. Like, I can't wait to see some behind the scenes shit to see how they like, pulled that off. Cause that mm. thing was fucking awesome. No, it's crazy. But I love oh. seeing some of the other cars come back in there through too. Right. And then obviously we got the very brief max cameo that, you know, just kind of on that hilltop overlooking some of the bullshit going on. Nice little nod to the franchise there. My personal favorite. It's, uh, sort of a mid character. Uh, but the guy who had the fucking, uh, sick black goat demon horns. Oh, wearing like a yeah. black veil. And he was on a motorcycle with like a air fan behind him. And then he was later flying around with that shit. So I believe that was, um, and what was Chris Hemsworth's character name in this? Like, for whatever He was like, Dementis. Dementis. he was one of his right hand men, but his he's the guy that broke off. The... Yeah. He's the guy that yeah. broke off and came back and fucked him up. And then yeah. they got fucked up. And what was it? It was because, oh, he broke off because the men disguised broke. his people as war boys. And then to make Fucking it look real, he started kill killing it off. All. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. That's crazy. And so I do love it how there's like a little bit of like infighting within the groups there and kind of showing how that kind of became its own thing later on, because obviously there are formidable foes there and they used to ride that same circle. So that made for interesting storytelling and battling as well. Yeah. Well, it's like people, people are saying, you know, they introduced air battle to this. And I was like, have you seen the road war here? Yeah. Uh, my guy is in like a fucking helicopter, like a little, like a basically the ghost, real Ghostbusters helicopter, essentially, is what he's flying around in. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people just rewatched Fury Road, and there's nothing wrong with that by any means. Yeah. I mean, the other movies are so far removed in time and space from like where we're at currently that you don't have to watch those to enjoy these. Now, does it make it more enjoyable? Absolutely. But you're also missing key elements and things in there that you may mistake as something new in the franchise when it's really been on there since the second movie. Yeah. So if I was to rank these movies right now, I think Fury Road's the best. I'm not, I just I'm sorry, I'm not gonna lie. Like Road Warrior, if you want like your old school cult guy credit, your old video store dude credit, but like yeah, Fury Road is fucking perfect my number two is road warrior and then number three is going to be furiosa and all those are highly rewatchable and then the regular mad max the first one mm -hmm. and my least favorites beyond thunderdome yeah beyond the thunderdome to me is it's just at a cheesy level and like some of the action sequences are shot so darkly and like things like that. It just, it doesn't feel like is wide open. It feels like you're <laughs> in a much smaller world than like you would fucking be in the rest of the other franchise. And so like, that's definitely my least favorite as well. I saw somebody say online that it reminded them of, uh, like, it feels like it's in the same universe as hook. <laughs> uh, and I was like, yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah, the kind of cheesy <laughs> effects, the, the cheesy action sequences there that feel a little bit off compared to the rest of them. Right. And it's and like, like it's, a tribe of lost children shit. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's yeah, just fucking odd. You know, just like I get that you're trying to do something different, but I think also think that how that turned out is why it took so long to get back into the franchise for George later on. You know, he's like, okay, if I'm going to go do this, I need to fucking make sure I do it right. Well, originally, yeah, Fury Road, Fury Road was going to come out with Mel Gibson in the early 2000s, but the filming fell through. Couldn't yeah, I think it. that was originally around 2003 is when he was lined up to do that. That was a while ago, you know, and uh, shows you how long he's had these ideas in there. And I wonder how much the scripts changed, but I honestly don't think it's changed that much. I think he kind of knew how he was going to do it, and the technology was just better there to tell a beautiful story because that's the thing with Fury Road. Not only is it a good action movie, but it's fucking visually like so stimulating and like fucking gorgeous. You want to hear uh, my biggest uh, fan theory here? Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, Fast 11 
is going to lead into Mad Max, the first one. <laughs> and then you're going to get a movie with Vin Diesel and Furiosa. I mean, fuck it. Why not, man? I've seen weirder shit. <laughs> if you're going to combine any franchises, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, probably probably pissing a lot of people off even mentioning this, but I think it'd be great. The fast movies are way over hated. Even the ones that they're they're goofy now, they've definitely jumped the shark. But at the same time, I'm like, all right, when's Fast Eleven coming out? I kind of need to see that. Well, I so. think that type of movie. I mean, aside from the first one, because the first one really fucking stands up, and I'd never seen any. I mean, you sold me on the first one because you're basically like. It's point break with cars instead of surfing. And I'm like, all right, you've got my attention. And then mm -hmm. it it really fucking is. And then after that, they get a little carried away, which is fun because sometimes you just want to go and fucking escape and they have some badass cars in there and badass technology and just get fucking ridiculous with it. And there's mm -hmm. fucking people love that, man. You need those types of movies. And it's funny because Charlize Theron is also in those movies. And mm -hmm. uh, Kurt Russell is in those movies. Like we have, there's a fun cast in those too. Yeah, the one movie crossover that I would like to see, and um, I had a, f a few ideas here, but I think we briefly talked about this before. But I would love to see them do a Mad Max story, where we get crazy old Mel Gibson, like as a senior version of Mad Max, like telling a story and like going back and forth and. Kind of combining that with, uh, God damn it, I'm fucking forgetting so many names tonight. Uh, Fury Road. Who played Tom, Max in it? Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy, God damn it. Yeah, and he's been in so much stuff. Yeah, so Tom Hardy and um, old Mel Gibson doing a story like that's where there's like some villain that's in the past and then in the future. Or right, you know, or whatever that is, the present and then the future. And you kind of have to like finish that storyline between a villain there and now. I think that'd be fucking fascinating while you still can. And that'd be a good way to bring Mel Gibson back into it. The other thing that I really want to see, and this is fucking dumb as all get out, but I want to see a version of Waterworld characters mixed in with Mad Max. Because in Waterworld, the whole world's fucking water besides like this little island they're basically trying to find of green land and everything and so to me the fascinating part of that would be that they're just so fucking dumb none of them could find australia but whatever happened to the rest of the planet or whatever so australia is all still intact as it is in the mad max world but then you get all these fucking assholes from the sea coming in trying to figure shit out from like that water world style movie because like <laughs> they're in the very much the same vein, the same kind of dystopian future, but very much opposites of what the fuck happened to the world. Right. But they're both very real options that could happen because obviously sea levels rising, all that type of shit, you know, there's things in there that would it happen that way? Exactly. No, but there's things in there that inspire a story that you can see playing out in some kind of fucked up way. Yeah. And so to me, that's a very interesting idea of like how how do those two stories kind of fall into like one world? I don't know. I'm fucking weird like that though. So I would like to see another Mad Max by George Miller before uh, he's too old. Just give us one more. Bring Tom Hardy back. I don't care about Mel Gibson. I mean, you can do that. Do him a bookend if you want. I don't care though. Personally, I, I'd be a fine either way. But bring Tom Hardy back for another adventure. I think he's got it in him, and then, then the thing I worry about is like if he's got these scripts written, who would he entrust this franchise to? Because you know it's doing well. In theory, it's it's doing well enough now that it's going to warrant more, regardless of George's involvement down the line. Well, it's doing well critically, but financially this weekend it's shitty, so people are saying, hey, he might not even get a, another fucking chance to do another one. Uh, and I hope he does. I've seen people complaining that... Uh, they didn't. They're not seeing it because it's a looks like a girl boss movie. And I'm like, oh Jesus Christ! Anybody who complains about this type of shit can just, just not, just ah, oh, God. Yeah, there's some. I mean, when you just look at the state of humanity and how fucking ignorant people are because of the internet, like extremes to both sides are just fucking insane. 
Now, obviously, there's some that are far worse than others, but at the same time, yeah, if you're going to try to boycott a movie because you think of a girl boss, I'm like, you realize this is the same director that's 79 years old. I don't think he has a fucking political agenda at his age. He's trying to make a good fucking film because he could have easily just not done this. The thing is, like, if you saw Fury Road and you didn't think that was like, I think that's like almost accidentally the most one of the most feminist movies of all time. It wasn't even necessarily it was relevant to the plot, but I don't think that's what he was trying to do. He was just like, all right, these are badass characters and this is what's happening. This is almost Furiosa's story more than it is Max's to begin with. Yeah. I so, mean, yeah. That's a fair assessment. But I don't think he went out of his way to say like girl power or anything like that. No. I think he went out of his way to tell a fucking compelling story and he's able to achieve that at a fucking level that few films are able to do in an action genre. Oh, man. It makes me want to watch Fury Road again, and I just watched it like two weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, if I go see Furiosa in theaters again, I'm going to have to watch Fury Road right when I get home. Like, that's the order I want to do it this time. I want to watch that and then watch this, you know? Yeah. Overall, though, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. I hope the box office turns around, you know, like with Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, like we were watching that shit really close just because that's one of our number one franchises. But with something like this, I'm not digging into the box office quite as much or the international release dates and how those are staggered and what that's going to do to box office, total or global box office. So, yeah. But I think this movie has a lot of legs and it's going to have a good theatrical run. Because there's going to be a lot of stuff to see, but like, what's the next big summer movie that's coming out? Mm, let me look at this. What is it? Uh, because I can tell you right now that it seems to me a lot of the shit that I really want to see kind of hits in July. Uh, for me, that's Twisters and that's Deadpool and Wolverine, uh, just to name two, right? So, We've got a little pocket of a window there, and there's still shit I haven't seen that I want to go see. So okay. someone that's a so June has a new Bad Boys movie, which some people are going to see. Um, let's see what else. A Quiet Place Day One that'll be pretty big for horror anyway and stuff. You know, people like that. It's I think it's only PG thirteen too. So. As the guy from Stranger Things the last season, Joseph mm -hmm. Quinn. We saw the trailer for it uh, in that. Yeah. It looked interesting enough, but like, I don't know. I don't care too much about those movies. And then in July, we do have a fucking new Beverly Hills Cop, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> is that hitting theaters or is that streaming only? It says Netflix, Paramount Pictures. Let's see. I don't know. Because that was one of those things that was part of Eddie Murphy's deal with Netflix, but. Obviously, Apple is doing movies that they're releasing theatrically and on their streaming service, so we're at a very fucking blurred time for like people producing movies and trying to hit a, a box office goal and then a streaming goal. So, Yeah, so it's going streaming. Okay. Uh, but Judge he Reinhold's going to be back in it, so hey. Yeah. Uh, Maxine on the 5th of July. And then we've got... Twisters on the 19th. Deadpool and Wolverine the week after that on the 26th. Uh, let's see. What else is there? Alien, Romulus, August 16th. Uh, the, the next Crow movie. Beale Juice Bill's in September, so interesting. Yeah, so like this summer has some big movies, but it doesn't have anything that you're just like, holy shit, drop everything you're doing in June. Which to me, June's usually kind of a big box office because typically you want a big fucking movie that's going to be able to play on or around the 4th of July opening because that's a long, another holiday weekend where people, a lot of people are trying to beat the heat. They want to see a movie. They'll go see a movie and then do fireworks or they got a long weekend, so they'll hit the movies and that's a great time to see a movie. So the fact that there's nothing kind of coming out leading up to that that seems like drastically awesome is kind of like, okay. So I think there's a lot of room for Furiosa to do well. It's just going to be, I think it's going to be a slow burner and a consistent burner. It's not going to be like all at once on the front end. Hmm. 
But I could be wrong too, man, because people are so fucking weird about their viewing habits now. Like I said, when you're tight on your budget and you're only going to see one or two movies in theaters this summer, you're only going to pick your top two. So if you're a casual moviegoer, Furiosa may not be at the top of your list if you're not like a diehard action fan. Shit, there's like a fucking live... There's an anime Lord of the Rings movie coming out in December. A Nosferatu remake. Isn't Willem Dafoe in that? Uh, yeah. Okay. But, uh, let's see. Isn't, um... Yeah, Willem Dafoe is not playing Count Orlock or anything, though. No, but I just heard he was in the cast, so... But he did play the... What's that movie called? He did play Count Orlock, but as a real vampire during the making of Nosferatu, didn't he? I believe so. And he's one yeah, of those kind of yeah character actors that always does interesting shit, because even his Beetlejuice character looks pretty... pretty interesting there. Even weirder, Nicholas Holt from... Renfield, as Renfield is in it. He's not playing Renfield. And then uh, Bill Skarsgård is playing Nosferatu. Down so, Warlock. So Bill Skarsgård is going to be in The Crow and then that all in the same year. Yeah, this, I mean that's this, pretty sick for him, but like <laughs> I, I love him as an actor. Like He fucking pulls off some roles that are just fucking incredible, but the Crow remake, I'm just like, unless you're going to try to make it like super, super fucking close to the comic book, I just don't see how you're going to outdo the original. And I mean, I could be wrong, but just the visuals and things I've seen so far were just like, I get that you're trying to be like in a modern audience of what that would look like aesthetically now as opposed to in the early 90s when that graphic novel was made. Yeah, but, but I just don't think there's the audience for it I don't know who the audience is supposed to be for that film, honestly. Yeah, that's the thing. I think they would have been better off doing a more traditional th approach and also doing it as a series instead of a movie. Do something yeah. different. Each season yeah. could be a different crow. Yeah, that would make sense, right? I mean, that's how all the other direct uh, video sequels were, I believe. It was around a different character's story arc. Yeah, similar setup, but you know, in that kind of same universe of everything. I'm only so. seeing, I'm not seeing shit for horror movies coming out this year. Like Terrifier 3 and Untitled Smile sequels, all I'm seeing for October right now. And then in September, there's Speak No Evil. Who gives a fuck about that? Like I said, man, it, it's, it's fucking tough for movies right now because. People don't have money, and if you don't have money to spend on movies, you don't have money to make movies because you're not getting your investment returned upon. So, But indie horror is always the best horror, right? So I think there's always going to be opportunities for that to do well and have shit come out that's going to surprise us. Yeah. So I think that'll be fun to see what happens there in the indie space. I mean, if you look at how Terrifier began and like how big of a franchise that's kind of becoming, that's the first unique horror franchise it's actually got a unique villain that kind of has some legs to stand on in a while yeah any final thoughts on uh, Furiosa it was awesome go see it in a the theater I think that pretty well sums it up hope the box office does well but like I said I, I think this is going to be a slow burner I think it's got a lot of opportunity yeah. to make some money over the next two months really I mean, it's a good action movie. It's a good summer movie. And first weekend out didn't necessarily fucking drive anyone crazy with it, but it's still open number one. So if you have two movies that opened on that and none of them crossed the 50 million mark, like they crossed 50 million combined, that's not a good Memorial Day weekend for movies at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think it's the quality I think it's, of the movies. I, I think, think it's, it's the fucking discretionary spinning for people honestly i was gonna say historically i think besides 2020 which 
was a whole different thing. This is like the worst Memorial Day weekend for film and like if you adjust for inflation in like 40 years or some shit. Yeah, I'm sure it is. And like I said, I just think there's so much going on. I mean, if you look at all the severe weather and damage and shit like that going on around everywhere, like there's just tons of shit out there keeping people away. And then the cost of existence, you know, making you want to go fucking crawl in a hole and die. Because it's the cheapest thing to do is sleep in the dark and avoid using any electricity or doing anything productive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, make sure you like and subscribe if you haven't already. Let us know what you think of Furiosa in the comments down below. And uh, we'll be back at it next week with uh, some shit to talk. Hmm. Not sure what yet. We'll figure it out. All right. Good night, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. And if I don't see you, go fuck yourself.